Okay, cool. All right. Yeah, so um yeah, it was cool. It's cool to have the opportunity to, you know, kind of go through some of my work because I don't typically think about it in terms of like kind of systematically figuring out well, where did I start? What was I doing? What was I interested in? What was what was the drawing style? How did that evolve over time? You know, how did that morph into what it is that I'm doing now and then present it to, you know, somebody in a way that kind of like makes, uh, you know, logical sense. Because to me, I'm just like, oh yeah, this makes sense. So I did this, now I do that. You know, like internally, I don't have this rational uh, structure to be able to understand like what I'm doing, even though my approach to my work is like pretty rational. Like I have sketchbooks that are filled up with, you know, drawings and diagrams of, uh, you know, different kind of styles that I'm attracted to. And then I document them and then I list in words what it is that I'm doing. But then going back in time, you know, I've been doing work for, I'm 47 now. I probably started when I was 23. So I'm almost going on 25 years. And, um, you know, the way I was never, when I grew up, I was never, I mean, I go back now and I look at, I had done some drawings and I go back now and I can kind of see like the lines that I'm attracted to and my attention for detail and different kind of like gestures that were in me, even when I was 12, 14, 16, mm. but I was never drawn into being an artist. Um, you know, I had got out of high school and I was just kind of adrift. Um, you know, I was going to community college and I was taking like electronic music classes, philosophy, screenwriting, yep. um, you know, all kinds of stuff like that. So I, I think psychologically I was uh, open, which is something that creative people, it's, it's a characteristic that, you know, creative people have. And I was kind of like circling around doing something artistic but um, like, I didn't really, I didn't really know. And uh, it was during that time in my life where I, I was like very, very lost. And um, I was living, you know, I'd grown up in the church. And then, you know, after I got into high school, like I really went into the world, you know, and, and uh, really lived in a way that kind of like uh, contradicted my core values. And so I actually started to develop a bit of a schizophrenic break when I was in my late teens, early twenties. And I started to deal with some really, really, really extreme, um, psychological tension that got so bad that I was just in a state of like paranoia, like delusional. Well, it wasn't delusional. It was like, I could hear people like thinking about me and uh talking how, how about me mean, how do you mean you were contradicting your own values well because um i was born in the church right and so i was born into this value system you know that was rigidly morally and ethically um driven with the consequences being like either you're a good boy and you go to heaven with your family forever or you're a bad boy and you burn in hell forever. So it's like kind of bookmarked on these like absolute, absolute truths. And whether or not those values dovetail precisely with what it is to be a human, like they're pretty, they're lined up pretty mm -hmm. close, you know, like treat people, like say, um, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, right? Yeah. Well, in after my parents got divorced when I was in junior high, more or less, and then I got into high school, like I was just so not prepared for the world. This was, you know, before the internet. And um, like, I just didn't have skills to like, I, you know, I was so naive going into the world that, you know, people weren't nice. People aren't, didn't want to be my friend. You know, people didn't like, it was, you know, like we, I went to school in a very poor kind of rough part of the country uh in northern california is very, very trashy like a lot of a lot of meth and uh unemployment and you know it was a small town and um yeah. and people were hardened you know like people you yeah. know i was going to high school with a bunch of people that had like older brothers and broken families and they just had this to a certain extent like a world weariness to them that like i 
it, it wasn't even on my radar as a possibility of like, I was so overprotected growing up mm. that, you know, I just thought everybody was like in the, you know, same kind of people in the church who was very innocent mm. and, um, you know, kind of Mormonish, really. I yeah. mean, it was very, you know, which is beautiful in a way, but it doesn't prepare you for the world at all. Mm. And uh, so you get out there and people start throwing their weight around and you're just like wrecked, you know, because people are mean in the conniving Machiavellian, you know? Yeah. And so then when I got, I got in with a group of friends that were very much, you know, there was like kind of the, like the jocks and the rebels in every high school. So, yeah. you know, we, we, we were like the rebel, you, you know, as you'd probably guess, but um you know, and so I got turned on to like literature and like rock and roll and we did a lot of drinking and cinema and we would like skip town to go to concerts. We would go from north of Reading down to Tijuana when we were 18. Like I was going to like strip clubs in Mexico, you know, when I was like 18, um, like driving from Northern California. It's like 13 hours, right? We'd go down for a weekend. I mean, we were wild and um like my buddy ken had a, a 1969 lincoln continental it's a basically the car that jfk was shot in so big mm. black mafia style car with suicide tours we had drive that all the way down to tijuana mm. we did that like a few times you know and we were all like honors students like so we were like top of the yep. school but we were just screwing off and so we would get this thing called directed study once we found that out and so the teacher would just assign you the homework and then you just do it on your off time. And mm -hmm. so we would always just do the mi bare minimum to pass. And we'd always do well enough on tests. Like there was probably about five of us and we just kind of, you know, just got through high school. And, uh, and at that time, were you thinking that you're going to go to college or not? Like no, uh -uh. I had no plan at all. Um, but during that, um, you know, I, I really got wrapped up in a selfishness. Hmm. And so the world became like what I can get away with kind of thing. And like, you know, it was, it was not treating people well. And it was like, I just like created my own like world. And, and at um, that stage, were you already rebelling against the church? Like you'd come oh, out and realized, hard core. Like realized like, the world's a lot more harsh. Hardcore. So. Yeah. Like my, like we would go to church, my dad, my dad had since stopped being a pastor, but when he was, uh, when I was 13 and he was still making me go to church every Sunday, I told him flat out, I said, the more you make me go to church, the more I hate it. Mm. I hate this. And I was like a lippy, but I was so aggressive and I was such a shit. How did he and, react um, to that? He stopped, stopped making me go. Okay. Yep. And, um, and that was when I was 13. And, uh, also there was during that time too, where I, I remember I had, when I realized that I was so unprepared for life that I remember I had this, I was walking through the quad in high school one time. And this was like, after somebody had told me about LSD, right. And I'd never heard about it. I was probably like 14, something like that. Yeah. And um, just the description of it blew my mind so hard that I started tripping when I was a kid. Mm. And I was like, there cannot wow. be something this powerful in reality. Mm. Like there just can't be like it, it just was so far outside of my worldview mm. that I'm like, this can't this can't be true. So you started and tripping then, just from a description of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's wrong. Yeah, I mean, I'm so sensitive to that kind of that kind of stuff. And um, and then I I had that experience and I and I remember I like it's funny now because I completely rejected the church, but I guess I had a conversation with God or prayed or something, or just talked to the sky is what I remember. But I remember mm -hmm. saying, like, you know, this world is so filled up with things that I don't know about that I want to experience everything. You know, mm -hmm. I want to experience everything. And so then that desire and intention went into meeting this new group of friends that really I we we went we went hard in high school you know I mean we really really partied a lot and um really really lived on that kind of um you know really really like beatniks really yeah. you know yeah. that kind of like looking for it 
and um yeah and that the the immediacy of the sensation and and so anyways hmm. what what that ended up doing to me because I don't think that I had a very well developed sense of self hmm. now that I look back on it and and I ended up just becoming very selfish and very self-centered and like not treating my relationships well, taking advantage of, of people, just being connect, like just doing, I don't know. I was just, I was, I was just lost. Yeah. And, um, you know, like I didn't go like all the way to the dark side, like criminal behavior and stuff like that, but just like morally and ethically, just not, it wasn't the way that I was raised. Like I went off in a new direction. And so what had happened psychologically is it became a split. And so I started living as if this value structure in life was true, even though it, it wasn't. And so I was putting all this energy into this world that I was making up. And so it kind of like created a new person and hmm. this schizophrenic, it wasn't total schizophrenia. It was like a pre pre schizophrenic. And, um, but I was started like hearing voices and, um, and I was like being taken over by like dark forces and like it got so bad that uh, there was one night I was hanging out and uh, me and a bunch of friends, this was in Cupertino after I had moved from uh, where I grew up in Northern California down uh, to the Bay Area and it was in Cupertino. And so there was this night when I completely lost control of my body mm. and there was I like the person that's talking to you now went to the background and this other thing animated me and it was taken over by like a demon. Hmm. And so I was watching myself say things that I wasn't saying. Yeah. And so there was like this other force that was going out and it was dark and it was shitty and it was, it was like demonic. Yeah. And I remember like feel I was, it was at night and, um, it was at night and I remember just seeing the, like this black cloud descending on me. Right. right. And, um, you know, we had been smoking uh, weed at that point and like marijuana at that point was like bad and, you know, it was very illegal and, and, um, and it was just very intense and it was something that I would do all the time. And I hated it every time. It was mm. so weird. I was in this like obsessive relationship with weed and for six months, I was smoking it all day long, every day. And every moment of it, I hated. And I yeah. kept doing it. It was, I don't know what was going on in my brain. But there was never a time and I enjoyed it. And I did it constantly. And so I was just like driven into this negative place. And so I just, you know, I was felt like I was being taken over by this force that had more control over my life, my words, my body than I did. Hmm. And it was terrifying, right? So finally, I was hanging out with these group of friends, and um, I finally had gotten away. And then I had, then I got on my bike, and uh, I started riding away. And I'm like, I remember at this time, I was, I started just like screaming at the sky, you know, hmm. I was like, like, what is going on? Like, you know, I'm like, why am I not in control of my own body? Yeah. And then like, I'm riding my bike and I like cross the street and I'm like, what is going on? And I remember like I slipped a pedal, you know, and all of a sudden the pedal hit my shin and I was like, ah, and I was like, why am I not in control? And as I was turning like my, uh, my um, tire kicked out on the gravel. Right. And then I was like, that's weird. It's like, every time I have a question, it's like the world answers me. And then I hit a rock really hard. It was like, mm. wham. And I was like, no. And I remember I stopped my bike and I, I was sitting there and I was like, I said, it's almost like the world is like talking to me. And I looked up and there was this light, this orb of light like above a path it was like a ball of light that lights like a pathway in a college where I was at De Anza College and I saw it and my my first thought was this god hmm. and I was like no 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 
And my intuition was, if this is fucking true, then everything in my life has been wrong, that I got it completely wrong for decades, right? And then this intuition came to me because it had a feeling, mm -hmm. right? And yeah. it was the feeling that comes with knowing anything is true. Mm. It's like when you figure out like an algebra equation, I remember you'd have these like aha moments where you'd be like, ah, there's something in that feeling that just tells you that this is true. Mm. And you go, okay, this is what true feels like. And so I had this experience with this light and I saw that it was like God or whatever. <laughs> it's weird to talk about. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and my initial reaction was just complete rejection of this thing. I was like, no, 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 no. Like this is, if this is true, then I am so fucked because <laughs> yeah. everything that I've been doing has been wrong. Everything's been a lie. Everything's been a self-deception. And, and I just looked at it and I, then I had the thought, it came to me and I said, if I deny this, I will never be able to perceive that anything is true because this is true. Uh, yeah. yeah. And so then I was like, okay, well, I have to accept this because this is true. And I'm like, fuck. And I'm like filled up with fear. I'm filled up with so much fear that I can't even like sit in a cafe and drink a coffee without looking around and seeing people that are like looking into my soul and judging me. Yeah. Like just quite like, I cannot be quiet. Like I'm so paranoid that I cannot not talk in to somehow try to control the situation or try to just like, I could, I was so anxious. I couldn't even be in my own skin at all. I mean, it was so terrible. And so then, so then I have this, uh, this experience with this light where this like the internal and external reality are like coming together. Hmm. And so I have this light and, um, and then I'm like, okay, well, this is true. I have to acknowledge that this is true. And so I'm looking at this light and then I immediately I'm like looking at my life. Right. And yeah. I'm like, it's like this judgment moment, you yeah. know, where everything that's in the book of life is now open and I'm looking at it and I'm like disgusted and ashamed and, and I'm like, Oh, what do I do? And, and I like ask this light. Now I'm just in this conversation with this light and, yeah. um, and I'm like, what do I do? Yeah. And the light said, uh, you're forgiven. And I'm like, mm. what, what? <laughs> and, um, and it says, you're forgiven. And I see like how beautiful life is, like how amazing and spectacular and gorgeous it is. And then what I had done in response to it is like take a giant shit all over the beauty of life. And then now I'm given all this beauty again. And it hit me. I remember I thought it was like as if somebody gave me like the Mona Lisa or something and was yeah. like, this is the most valuable thing in the world. Now it's your job to protect it. Yeah. And I'm like, what? Like, I can't do this. This is too much. This is too heavy. And so I, you know, I asked the light again. I was like, well, what do I do? And he said, well, you, you, you pray. Hmm. And I'm like, okay. Um, so I was like, okay, I recognize that I'm in this spot. I don't want to be in this spot. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to move forward. What do I do? Mm. And like, I open up my eyes and this light that was like on a pole with an orb on it, mm. um, had a bunch of other lights that went down this path. Right. So it was like light, 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 light. And I was like, okay, follow the light. Mm. Just go down, just, just follow the light. And I'm like, okay. So now I'm like on my bike, I'm like walking <laughs> my bike. Right. And I'm like walking down this path. I'm like light light okay follow the light follow the light and then i remember just because of the nature of my mind was so undisciplined that it started wandering and it immediately tried to get myself out of this situation right and get me back in my old self yeah and so then i caught it and then i prayed immediately i'm like i'm like i'm gonna forget like i'm going to forget like i can't stay in this yeah. i'm like what do i do and then it was, you have to remove all of these fears. 
you have to remove all these fears because the fears are what's causing you to go into this other place. And so I had to go through and like systematically go through every single fear that I had in my life. Hmm. And, um, and then this is like an epic, epic, um, ordeal that lasted for a week Mm. first and then it lasted for months and then it's 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 become the foundation of my life like how I Mm. dealt with that and there's a bunch of like overwhelming mystical realities of like being in relationship with this divine force and what it what it does Mm. But the um the functionality of what happened was I realized that the fears that I had were taking up more space in my inner reality than my desire for love and connection and wanting to um mm-hmm. be, be connected with God because it was too scary, it was too much of a responsibility at one point. And so I just had all these bad behaviors of avoidance and um and they developed into fears and then they became like pathologies. And, and so from that point forward, I was in this process of stripping down my life and removing all of my fears. And so, you know, I handled as much as I could in my immediate environment, dealing with, you know, my family and, you know, getting, you know, repairing my relationships. And then it got to this point where I was like, man, this fear goes so deep that like, what happens if I were to like, lose my, what if society didn't fulfill me or didn't support me anymore? And then I was like on the streets, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, what do I, that's a huge fear of me. So, so the decisions in my life, are conservative because I'm like, well, I should just take a responsible job. I should make money. And so I don't end up on the streets. And I was like, yeah, but that's not true. You know, it's like, I should, I should be able to be okay, even if I'm on the streets. And so what I did was I got rid of all my stuff. I bought a VW bus and I moved into my bus when I was like 23. How long was this after the religious experience this would have been about a year okay so it was about a year maybe nine months or a year um i mean because i was like doing a lot of work you know i was just like this was the only thing in my life this completely changed my life like i was going forward and then it i just walked out of my life i mean there was the person i was before then and then the person i was afterward everybody was like what the fuck happened to nathan Mm. everybody thought i lost my mind yeah um my family was scared for me because, you know, my brother had mental problems before he died. And, you know, he was in first time he went into psychiatric care was he was 13. And so we've had a lot of trauma in our family. And so my fam, my family looking at me was like, oh, God, like yeah. what? Like, where is he going? Because I was so on another planet and I was like talking about God and talking about reality and talking. And people were like, dude, this dude he's going to fall off the planet and not be able to come back. And so people were watching me and just like, what, what is going on? My friends were like, what, nobody knew what was going on with me. And so so, like this, this revelation of God, did you mm -hmm. see as the same Christian God that you grew up with in the church? Yeah. Like a reconciliation between those two, or was it still? Well, the, the initial, the initial experience of the light, was something beyond that but later in that night which i mean we should sit down and do like a deep dive into this and i can tell you all the stages of the spiritual unfolding but there was after i went so i had kind of like left my body and went into the heavenly realms and then went into the hell realms and then came out of it with this shining face of uh jesus this was all like this was this was within an hour of what was going on. I mean, I went into a complete out of body near death experience where my consciousness like left my body Mm. and I went into this other place. Like when you, when you hear about non near death experiences and people doing that, like that was like, I had, I had a near death experience, but just from sheer force of consciousness, just 
yeah. just blasted me out of my body. You and um, oh God, it was like total annihilation hmm. in the most painful way. Cause that ego is actually attached through feeling. Hmm. I mean, it was just, it just like ripped me apart. I mean, you know, and this is all in the tradition, like shamanistic tradition, you know, it, it turns out that this is all not really normal, but it kind of fits into an archetypal pattern that a lot of people have been experiencing for a long time. But the thing was, this is before the internet. And, um, mm. and I had no, so I thought that I was the only person in the world that had experienced this. And I'm like, okay, I guess I'm the only human that experienced it, but this is the most real thing. Like, I know this is true. I know that this happened. It was never a doubt in my mind. But every time I tried to talk about this experience to anybody, they're like, I have no idea what you're talking about. And then I didn't even know. I couldn't find it anywhere in the historical record. I didn't know anything until one day I was walking through a bookstore and like I would just turn on to this like higher form of consciousness where the world would become information. Yeah. And so like everything that's in the world was information. And so I walked into this bookstore and it like turned on. And yeah, and, and I was like, okay, what am I doing? It and this, the logos guided me to this uh, discard pile of books that was getting ready to be reshelved. Hmm. And I reached out, and there was this pur purple book, and it ended up being uh, William James, uh, the Nature of Religious Experience. Hmm. And so I looked it up, and there was a case study of a guy that was like led into the light. That saw this light, and this light was this like transcendent reality that gave him information, told him how to like fix his life. Yeah. And then, um, and then William James said in the, in the notes, he said that this was a, you know, religious experience. It was like a mystical experience. And I thought at that point, mystical was something like witchcraft or something like I had a, I had a different yeah. idea about what that word mystical was. So I never, I never turned over that rock when I was trying to look at, what had happened to me so then when he said mystical experience then i went to the public library and went to the card catalog and then looked it up for mystics and then boom like everybody was there like all the mystics were there and they're all saying what i experienced and i was like oh my god i'm like not the only person yeah you know i mean it, it makes me emotional thinking about it right now because i was i was so committed to this that I was like, if I'm the only person on the entire planet that has experienced this, it's still true, even if yeah. nobody else can validate this. And then all of a sudden, I was like, oh my god, like they're all they're all here, like all the heavy hitters of all time, like they're all here. And I'm like, oh, okay. So then that gave me confidence. I was going through these, I was still going through this fear inventory, and um, and so I had had this insight that society was kind of godless in a way and yet i was being held by i was being dependent on society you know and like all this modern trappings of you know whatever society and yeah. um and deeper inside i was being led by this insight into god or that's this transcendent logos and it was telling me you don't, you're bigger than this. Hmm. You don't, you don't live under the fear. Do not live under the fear of what society can and can't give you. This yeah. is a fear. This is going to stop you from experiencing this reality because you're not going to be able to get, you're not going to be able to see truly because you're going to be blinded with fear of like, well, what if I end up on the streets or what if I, you know, lose my apartment or something like that? Okay, so crucified. then I just, yeah. And so I just went onto the streets. So I just walked out of my life and bought a VW bus and um, exited society. Hmm. And um, so I just started living in this bus on the streets, like just to not be afraid of living on the streets. So I went and lived on the streets. Hmm. And, um, and so then, you know, I was kind of met some fortuitous people. I started getting into like uh, wilderness survival kind of things. So I'm like, I'm like, okay, well, if you don't live in society, like, do you just keep going back, you know, to yeah. how native people used to live? And I was like, okay, well, I got to look into that. So then I started, you know, learning about wild edible medicinal plants and all this stuff. And so then I ended up uh, finding this uh, wilderness survival school that I got involved with. And I did a two-year apprenticeship up there called Headwaters. Um, 
outdoor school, which is up in Mount Shasta. You can still go to it today. Yeah. And, um, and I went and I would go up there. So I was just like, so I was learning. So I got all the way down to fire, water, shelter, food, which yeah. is like, if you're in a survival situation, right? Like you're in a plane crash on the side of a mountain and all of a sudden you don't have anything and you've reduced your life down to the most essential things. It's fire, water, shelter, food. And so I had reduced my life down to that. And I, had, I you know, just learned how to be able to live as that thing, you know. Were you living up there for so two years during the apprenticeship or were you just like? Uh, I was, I was actually a waiter at that time too, but see, I was in my VW bus. So it's weird when you're in a bus, like you don't have any home. It's just wherever it is that you're at is where you're at because it's not like I would go somewhere and then be like, well, I got to get back to, you know, cause there is no getting back. Yeah. You're just out. You're just living out. It's incredible amount of freedom. Hmm. And, um, and, uh, so I had got, I had reduced myself down to zero and I had completely restarted my life. And I was like, okay, I'm going to get, I'm going to remove everything off the table as much as I possibly can. And then I'm going to build myself back up from this new reality. And during that time, I started having visions, like seeing patterns in my head. And I would sit down and I'd start drawing these patterns. Right. And like, I, I don't know, it was, it was interesting because, you know, like I said, I was never really specifically an artist before, but I just had this intuition. And yeah. so I started drawing. And then what I would realize is that, you know, I'd have a sketchbook and, um, and the, uh, what I would do is I'd put like one mark on a page, right? Like one line. And I put a line on a page and depending on like, is it straight? Does it curve? Is it thick? Is it thin? Is it like sharp or is it wiggly? Like I was able to see that that gesture, that human gesture had consciousness in it. And it had like a feeling, right? And I could I could perceive that feeling. Mm -hmm. And then I would, so I'd do a mark and depending on what that is, then I would do another mark and then I'd do another mark. And then that became like a composition. Mm -hmm. And that whole thing would start building this, um, this like structure of like feeling tones to me. Cause I'm synesthetic. So my uh, senses overlap, like I, yeah. see colors and hear shapes and mm. feel I can feel paintings you know like I can mm. feel paintings on my my face mm. um and so um so I just started doing this right so I would like do these sketches right this is like while I'm I mean I'm out like I'm out in like I'm not living the life like other people are living like I'm in my own universe and I'm doing this and I realize that this is a method where because my intuition is telling me do this, don't do this, do this, don't do this. Following this intuition illuminates a hidden part of my own reality that I couldn't get to without this practice. And and so, I, want to, I want to drill down on that. So you said that while you were doing yeah. these drawings, what, you would get a sense of do this, don't do this. Like what, what, yeah. was, what mm -hmm. was that experience like? Did you like... Do you see on the page where the next line should be? Or sometimes you look at a piece of yeah. paper and you're like, no, it's not there. Like, how did that manifest? Because it's yeah, because that's a very interesting well, let me show you. Said, because it's kind of like conscience. It's like knowing like not to do something or knowing. Yeah, yeah, for it. sure. Yeah. So I wasn't really expecting how this conversation would go, but let me just show you what I'm talking about. So in, yeah. in this in the slide presentation, like just as an overview, like this is kind of where I ended up. You know, like this is something you remember this piece and we can come back to it. And then something I did really recently. Yeah. Um, uh, it's like other kind of murals that I do and now. I just want to go back to the first one for a second. Like that's got to yeah. be one of the most iconic San Francisco murals now. That's been up for like nearly yeah. 10 years. Now. Since 2017. So you've gone from like. And it was the first. Drawing in sketchbooks, the... painting giant murals on the side of yeah. buildings. Yeah. Yeah. And I had a whole, I had a near death experience painting that too. That was the first time that I ever uh, painted outside. First time, you know, I could tell you that story too, which is like pretty interesting, but, um, but anyway, so this is where it is. That I ended up 
or that I'm at currently. That was about five years ago. This I did uh, a couple of months ago. This is downtown San Francisco. So as we go through this stuff, you can kind of see like how things have progressed. So yeah. this at one point, a few years ago, I went through everything that survived over the years since I started drawing and I numbered it, right? So in the chronological order that I, I went through my sketchbooks and I, everything that I could find, I went through and I numbered it. Mm -hmm. And so um, also I, when I would do these drawings, like the one that you're seeing here, like I would show people on the street, you know, in the coffee shops and stuff. And anytime that anybody expressed that they liked something, I just ripped it out of the sketchbook and gave it to them. So all of the best stuff that I did during this time is all gone because I was practicing detachment because I was, an, that was another fear. I had another fear, which was like, oh, I need to hold on to this thing because it's like really good. But then I had to change my brain to be like, okay, well, the thing that allowed me to do this in the first place is still going to be there, whether or not I have the previous artifact. Yeah. And so I was just ripping out pages of my sketchbook like this and just giving them away constantly. Right. It reminds me of so I only have like. I was just going to Reminds me of Bukowski, like when he first started writing poetry, he would, uh, he wouldn't yeah. make copies of his art. So he would just write a poem, put it in an envelope, send it to a magazine. And he did that for like thousands and thousands of his poems. He's like, no, I don't even wow. want to back up. And I think it's a similar idea where you've, you've got to know internally yeah. that you've got the stuff, regardless of whether you've got a copy of the artifact. Yeah. And this was like right at the very, very beginning. So this was, I think this is in the first sketchbook that I ever had. And this is within the first hundred drawings that I ever did. And then the last time when I counted, which probably about 10 years ago of all the stuff that was left, I think I got up to like 2,400 pieces. Right. So I've literally done thousands and thousands and thousands of drawings. Yeah. And, um, and of the stuff that survives that either wasn't sold or lost or given away or whatever. The last time I counted, I don't know, is it it's probably, I'm probably around like 3000 pieces, 3000 drawings no, or mm. pieces of art that I've done, gone through the process of like creation and then archiving. Yeah. So, um, so this is an example of something. So I would put like a line down, right. And then, you know, based on how this line was, whether it's like, like I would at the beginning, I was trying, like my hand wasn't very skilled. So I would tell myself no rulers, no tools. Um, mm. I would, cause I just want to train myself to be able to draw a straight line. And I just couldn't do it in the beginning. Right. Yeah. And so I would get really frustrated, but then I realized, I was like, even though I can't do the thing that's in my head that I want to be able to do the point of art, the point of my art is to document where I'm at at that time like this is a perfect artifact of where my brain was at the time so this is like me living in a vw bus like sitting in a coffee shop late at night just drawing you know just by myself on a table you know probably 24 25 years old you know just out drifting in the world yeah. and just looking at this going like why do i like this line and not this line like why is it what is going on and so this would all, you know, create like a, like a portal into like a part of my inner experience that I wouldn't be able to get to unless I was doing this. It was like a, mm. it was, it's like a meditative practice, but then you're using this tool as like, kind of like an anchor, you know, because once you externalize a line, now you have like a, a, a place that you can kind of hang on to. And then as you build this up, you're like, oh, I like this, or I don't like this. I need to change this or just let this go or, you know, whatever it is. So, okay. So I would do something like that. I would sit down, you know, this would take me probably 15 minutes to draw something like that. Yeah. And I would do it very slowly. You know, I'd put like one line down I'd look at it, look at it, look at it. And then I'd add another line and then I'd be like, well, what if I just dashed the line instead of had it. Kind of... So it's all an experiment, right? Yeah. So then like this would be like a second version, right? Where I would say, well, what happens if I do like squiggly lines? Like, how does that make me feel? You know, mm. and then I put dots on it instead of dashes, right? So I'm like, okay, you can see like, for whatever reason, compositionally, like I had the same kind of idea, 
Yeah. You know, and this is just like the, with the most simple things that you could do, like an Egyptian, you know, 3000, you know, years, you know, ago, 5,000 years ago, whatever it is, they could be doing this exact same thing. They could just be writing on a piece of papyrus like this. Like yeah. the technology is like, I mean, this is like cave paint. Like this is so simple. So like during this time, it was just like reduce everything down to as close to zero as possible and start with that. It's like ultimate, ultimate first principles thinking. Yeah. And so then, you know, so then I would do this. And I'd be like, well, what, how does this make me feel? What is going on here? Why do I like this? Why do I not like this? Why is my intuition even telling me to do this? Like, where is this going? And so then I'd be like, okay, well, it's like certain points in space that are pushing me to other points in space, you know? So then I got really into arrows for a long time because the arrow is like, it's this thing that you need to point you somewhere else. It's like the arrow is not the thing. You know, the point of the arrow is not, it's the point of the arrow is not the arrow. It's whatever the arrow is pointing to. So I got really interested in that. I was messing around. And, and so then I would start realizing like, oh, there's these kind of like underlying structures, you know, that kind of, when you hit them, they feel right or wrong. Like there's a kind of a underlying structure to the way that the universe is like built out. And so then I would do things like, well, what if you colored in the dots, you know? And then also this is, so this piece right here is probably from like 10 years later. So mm -hmm. I'd start, I'd done something like that before, but then later for whatever reason. So another theme of my work is that I'm kind of like in a Jungian sense, like circumambulating around course, yes. you know, so maybe I'll do like a couple of things. And then all of a sudden, 10 years later, I'll like come back and be like, oh yeah, I was messing around with that. What's that? And I would just keep going back and like collaborating with myself, you know, yeah. and developing ideas and, you know, kind of fleshing things out. But, you know, my brain, the way that it works, I'm so interested in all this stuff. Like I'll find one thread and then it'll branch off into this other reality where all of a sudden I'm in this other world. And then I leave like this kind of work behind and but the one of the strategies that I had like during this time and it took me I was in this for like almost 15 years is I would say only black and white um only line work and I would do like different things where I would just do like a simple gesture right so this would be okay only circles and short c curves you know what can I do with that and then there's this natural intuition of like there's a certain amount of space in between each one of these that feels right. So there's like a, yeah. so the, I don't know, there's all these like underlying rules that I'm not like aware of, but I'm naturally doing. So I'm acting out this value system that I'm not even aware of consciously. But then when I do something on paper, I'm like illuminating this value system, which is also kind of like what was going on in my spiritual experience is like I was living this way and I didn't know it was, I was in violation of my own value system. And, and what, so what this is a way. To, what made you want to stick with black and white and abstract art? Cause that's, because a, that's it was a pretty so, big decision to be going into art and saying like no realistic like figures like yeah. nothing even that you would see in the material world and no color because like that was all distraction mm. because as soon as you do as i realized i was like as soon as i do like a horse yeah. you know for example it's gonna be like well what kind of horse is it you know where is the horse in the land like is that a big horse a little horse so then you're thinking about the horse but if you're doing this it's completely detached from any other associations yeah. And so it's a cleaner way of getting all the way down into the space that I wanted to explore because it's truly non-representational. It's like, yeah. it's representational of a value structure, Yeah, a hidden invisible value structure. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so, and so, and also because, you know, my impetus to be able to do this work is I'm trying to reduce everything down to zero you know, so even I'm limiting the amount of gestures that I'm allowing myself, right? Like there's no triangles here. There's no squares. There's no like, like it's just a couple of gestures and then trying to see what comes out from reducing, re reducing the possibilities as much as possible because it's more clean that way. <laughs> it's like, it's like working in kind of like a sterile environment, like a scientist that has like a, a laboratory that's not infected with any other 
foreign uh, contaminants. You know, it's just, yeah. you get to really narrow down on just the one thing. Yeah. And so anyway, so, so this, so we went from like, uh, you know, this is like, this is how it started. Right. And then it would kind of develop into doing all this. And then eventually it, it got into doing things on walls. So this is, uh, this is like one of the biotech places that I do. And so I just kind of developed this system, right? So that once I figure something out, it's just like in my head and then I can just go back and do it. And then once you kind of blow it up to like person size, now you're in the drawing and that does a lot of, it does a lot of work, um, just the size itself. And so, you know, it's taken a long time to get that. So this is one of the first murals that I ever did. This is at Caltech down in uh, Pasadena. And this is, again, just like externalizing a value structure, right? So there's an intuitive, like I'm only going to do a certain kind of lines with certain thickness. And then as it goes towards the top, in this case, there's a... uh, you know, there's a condensing of the lines that happen in this kind of like algorithmic style that if you do it right, it feels good. And, um, and so I would just sit down and, you know, using the same system that I was talking to you about before, I would be able to just take one line and then just like push it into, into the world. Um, How does that manifest? Like if you, if you look at that wall, do you have like a yeah. flash of a vision of what it looks like as a whole, or do you just start with that one? Yeah, line? sometimes. And then, uh, and then if the I'm doing something for a client, if I'm doing something for a client, then I want to be a little more predictive of what's going to come out because they're paying me a bunch of money. So I don't want to do just like raw experimentation on the wall. Yeah. Um, and just be like, well, we'll see if it comes out or, you know, I mean, that's, I have had clients that let me do that because they say like, I love everything that you do, no matter what you do, I'm going to like it, just go crazy. And then that's, I'll show you some pieces later that people let me do that. And uh, that's really cool. But it is this kind of, it's like controlled chaos, you know, it's like, I've been doing this for, cause I've done thousands of these. Like I know how to be able to bring this out and I know how to be able to fix mistakes. I know like if something's going sideways yeah, and I'm not going to be able to recover from it, like I can feel that happening so quickly that I just stop and then I can make it work. So my mistakes, I catch them early and I can feel them when they're happening. Like I don't, I don't double down and I'll show you later. It, it's like, and I even got to this place too, where I had this relationship with my work where I would be like, okay, my intuition is telling me do this, do this, do this. And I'm like, where is this coming from? Like, is this me? Is this some other like for like, I have no idea where this is coming from. Yeah. Like I cannot find the me in there that's making a decision on where this is coming from. And so in order to be able to find that, I was doing these experiments one time where I would be like, okay, I have all these intuitions of what I should be doing. What if I followed my intuitions on what I shouldn't be doing? Yeah. So then I would be like, it, normally I'd put a line here and I wouldn't put a line over here. So then I'd put a line over there. Yeah. And so then I'd be like, what? And then the craziest thing happened was the same thing came out. The same thing. Hmm. So me doing this work in this style, even if I were to go against what it is that I thought was right and wrong, it still came out the same. And I'm like, what is going on? I mean, this whole thing is just like crazy. Like, it's just, it's, it's like trans rational. Yeah. You know, it's like this other, there's a certain amount of logic that gets you there, which is like, I am going to draw squares. Yeah. And they're only going to be black and white and they're going to be thick in the middle and thin on the outside and see what happens. And you think like, okay, that's very logical. And then you go through this process and you have no idea why your hand goes to a certain place on the page and draws that kind of square when you could, you could still have a million different kinds of squares, but I do it this way in this thing. So this thing is like calling out to me being like, recognize me, you know, it's like, there's this, 
And I tend tend to think about it now as like my highest potential, right? It's like my highest potential is in there, like telling me how to become it by saying, do this, don't do this, do this, don't do this, don't do. And this process of that started from just drawing in these sketchbooks like this, this is one of the first drawings I ever did. Right. Hmm. And, and this has the process of doing this drawing has, you know, now I'm like, you know, now I have a whole art company with employees and work these big, you know, like this is following this intuition into my highest potential from just starting with drawings like this has made me like a very successful artist. And that I do like, you know, big monumental sized murals now, because this thing inside of me wanted to be known in this way. And I'm like, is that me? Hmm. Am I doing that? Who is doing this? And, yeah. you know, people, and it's crazy because everybody's like, oh my God, your work is, your style is so you. And I'm like, I don't mm. see that at all. I just see this thing coming through me. Like, I don't see the me in this. Like, I don't look at this and be like, oh, that's Nathan. Like, I know, like, if I were to see this, I'd be like, oh yeah, that's something that came out of me. But I don't look at this as me. I look at it as like this alien thing that's giving birth through me. Do you think it's more like- It's the- very the- strange it's more like the Jungian idea of the self, like the deepest down you, because you, the way you describe that is like, it's your deepest potential. And that's how Jung describes the self. So as separate from yeah. the ego, because when you look at this, you're like, this isn't my ego deciding this. Like no. these, these intuitions are coming from somewhere else, but then people describe it as being very you. So maybe it's like the, but my ego, my but my ego is also like, oh, this is good. Like, keep doing this, you know, or this is bad or like, oh, you really fucked up here. Like, for example, you know, in this during this time, like now I could draw this line and it'd be perfect. Yeah. But during this time, like I couldn't draw this like my hand was just so shaky. You know, it's like I wanted to have this nice curve, but I couldn't draw it. Yeah. You know, and so then I'm like self-conscious to be able to be like, ah, oh, shit, like I can't do this. And then I had to be like, no, 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 no. This is like a perfect representation of your mind at this time. And it has value because it's perfect. You know, in the same way that like a diary excerpt is perfect because yeah. the point of it is to just state where it is that you're at. And yeah. so that's what this is. Right. So for whatever reason, like just like I, this is within like the first hundred drawings that I ever did, too. And you're like, well, I don't know what's going on with this. This is some, like, I don't know. I have no idea. So then I would start doing other things like, oh, if I can draw, if I can do these like curves and draw fast, then the curves can have this nice line. And then I figured out this thing too. It's like where I would like fuck up the the line. I would just like put a shape over it to kind of cover it up, you know? And I'd learn all these like little tricks. Right. Like you can still see like this line right here isn't really nice, but it was the best I could do at that time. And then maybe like I fucked it up over here. So then I put this shape here and then I'd have all the shapes work together. And I'm like, oh, okay, that's kind of what it is. And so then this is like me practicing, trying to draw straight without a tool, you know, while I have like a sketchbook on my lap or something like that, which is very hard to draw well on in the first place. And then I'm like, you know, just messing around with composition and trying to see like, well, if I black out certain areas, how would that make me feel? And um, so this is all within the first hundred drawings as well. And I would just go through these practices, you know, just sitting in a coffee shop and drawing this for like 15 minutes. Then I do other things like how do, if I draw lines in a different way, like how do they make me feel, you know, like, yeah. How does the one on the left feel different than the one on the right? Like, what is it about these lines that, have this quality that makes me feel differently and so i'd just be doing these drawings all the time and so then this this was probably about uh five years in maybe and i went to europe and you know i'm sitting with my buddy in a chinese restaurant in prague and like there's coasters and uh, salt and pepper shakers on the on the table. So i'm like oh well what if i just trace these out so i'm so i'm always just like kind of interacting you know yeah interacting with the world and and just doing these experiments you know everything's an experiment so uh, at so this, then i'm at this stage like you're, you're getting into art you're creating these abstract drawings in a very unique way 
who were the artists yeah like the artists from the past that you look to for inspiration was it abstract artists, so as soon as artists? as soon as as soon as i saw that i had something here i had the thought um maybe i should go to school and yeah. learn um you know make a profession out of this i should be able to make some money and then the next thought that immediately followed was if i go to school i'm gonna have a professor that's telling me this is good this isn't you should yeah. do this shouldn't do this this is like this this is not like this and then i wouldn't have the purity of my own experience of my own mind because now i would be affected by what other people had done yeah and so i made a conscious decision that i wasn't going to look at any art hmm. for years i hmm. didn't pick up an art book i didn't go to a museum i didn't go to school i did i i completely pushed away everybody else's experience of art for years yeah. years and years and years i was like i'm not even picking i'm not even going to look at art hmm. and so so i wasn't a, i wasn't influenced by anybody because i specifically kept myself clean yeah you know i didn't want because that wasn't the point of what i was doing what i'm doing is i'm trying to understand my own mind so it doesn't what other people have done isn't really relevant for me, but yeah. that all changed later. But at this time I was, I just didn't, I just didn't want to be touched by anybody else. You yeah, know, it's I just like you I were, wanted to, I wanted to be pure. Yeah. And you wanted to work out your own value structures instead of going into yeah. the cultural artistic value structure and copying that or letting it influence you, you just yeah. went to your own way of doing it. Yeah. And I know that I, I knew at that time I wasn't strong enough to be able to remain independent that I would be like, oh, this works. I could do that. Oh, this guy mm -hmm. sold this for that. Like I would make this. And during this time, like yeah. I was broke. Mm -hmm. Like I had, no, I mean, I was like broke. So I mean, you were still working as a waiter at this time? Yeah. 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 Working as a waiter and just drawing all the time. It was my, I was just obsessive about this drawing. And so, um, you know, so I do different experiments, like, you know, what if I made the line subtly bigger as it goes around? And this is all me trying to teach myself how to draw straight. And then, uh, and then about 10 years later, I did this. And so you can really see like how my hand developed, yeah. you know, it's like, this is all freehand now. So I had, you know, I had taught myself how to be able to draw straight lines at this point, but it took like 10 years. So, yeah. you know, this was like the very beginning, first hundred drawings that I ever did. And this is probably well into like a thousand, something like that. Hmm. So this, I'm probably at like the 10,000 hours of doing art, thinking about art, living art, you know, just thinking through, living through that lens, pro probably around this time, you know, I probably have 30, 40,000 hours into, uh, being an artist whatever that is and it's amazing how so this is another at the learning is like it's not just oh a yeah process or a process of seeing it's like physically training your hand to be able to draw a straight line or a curved line in the way yeah. you it. like it's almost like it's well an and athletics and the other thing too yeah and the other thing too is like i could have just used a ruler yeah you know what i mean like i could draw a straight line with a ruler yeah. But I specifically said, I need to train myself to draw straight without tools because I want that level of mastery. Yeah. And so this is like, I think this is, if I remember right, I think this is like the 50th drawing I ever did. Yeah. Something like that. Um, And so then like, you'll see like, this is when shit was really, really raw. I, I put these in here for you because I thought they're just so weird. And yeah. um, like, this is me at the very beginning being like, watching stuff come out of me going what the fuck is going on <laughs> like how yeah. is this coming out of me like what is what is this like mm -hmm. what is this and i'm like why do i want to do triangles like this and circles and do why what is going on so this is at the very this is within the first hundred drawings and this is like me i can't draw a straight line for anything you know but you can see me like working out compositions, you know, like getting more and more complicated. But, you know, like, what is this? I have no idea. I've never seen anything like this. 
like this is kind of like ancient hieroglyphics in a way it's like some like alien language nonsense it's, i don't know i don't Just know what it pausing is here like you you were, you were saying that a lot of the development of a piece is kind of rule based where you come up with a restriction at the start but if you mm -hmm. go back to that last one like we're like, yeah but then some of them but then, break away but from then the rule but then the rule is on this one is like how many elements can i add without it going into chaos uh got right it. so then yeah, part yeah. of the rule would be like okay let me reduce everything down to one or two gestures and then the rule became well what if i just added a bunch of stuff and then whatever whatever it is that i felt went and then when i do stuff like this i'm like this doesn't feel this is too chaotic you know like this is i mean it's kind of interesting but it's like it's kind of too chaotic like there's not enough structure to it like you can see me trying to give it structure but you're like this is it doesn't hmm. So you create, I don't know, like it doesn't. Yeah, you create rules sometimes that push you further into the chaos because you would think, you know, if you if you have yeah. like a preconceived rule structure and then you work it out, it's going to be extremely orderly. But it's like you can sense when right. too much order and you make a rule that pushes you into chaos. Yeah. Right, and I and then I break myself too. It's like I'll I'll break, I'll do rules to break rules. Yeah, but it's always rules. So part of the rules is break the rules. Part of the rule is do the thing that you wouldn't don't want to do. Yeah. You yeah. know? Yeah. And so then then I finally, you know, so this is probably in my second or third sketchbook. So now I'm probably like 200 drawings in, maybe 300 drawings. And um, and I've found that if I can have these like curves in it and fast kind of sweeping gestures, like the lines are nicer. And so I'm like, oh, okay, maybe I'll focus on that for a while. And so I would just do practices where I'm like, you know, like this one swirling kind of solar system looking thing is like, that's just one gesture, right? And then, you know, so everything, so this is probably like a two minute drawing or something, you know, just really fast. And so then I would go through phases where I'm just like, hmm. do a drawing, do a drawing, do a drawing, do a drawing. I would do like 10 in a night you know, just like whipping them out, you know, fast, 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 go through this, go through this, go through this, go through this. Yeah. And then some, you know, and so then all this like stuff would just come out, you know, so this is like a Sharpie and where I'm like, I don't even know what the rule structure is here, you know? So here's the rule structure is probably just raw intuition of just keep everything within the borders of the page and have some sort of like line weight distribution intuition. Like, I, I don't know. And then like other, so this is at the very beginning too, where I'm like, what am I doing? Like, what is this? And I'm like trying to work out composition intuitively, but I don't know what I'm doing. It's like, it's almost like when you look at AI at the beginning of like mm. trying to, when you look at the first versions of mid journey, trying to put Yoda together, and it's just yeah. like a mess. You know what I mean? Like you can see yeah. elements of weird stuff, but then it just takes being trained over and over again to get it. So this is like kind of the beginning of that phase where I like have all these elements. I don't know how they work together. You know, it sits on the page in this weird way. And I I don't know what is going on, but yeah. I'm like, I'm just experimenting with things and it's just, I don't and know. But now it's really interesting, you like, know. At this stage, did you have a, a goal to do this for a job and be a professional artist like no you, mm -mm. okay so this was purely just for your personal enjoyment and understanding well i knew that i couldn't sell these drawings what am i going to yeah. sell one of these drawings for like 50 50 or whatever there was just no there's no path forward yeah. economically to be able to make this happen and i mean these are all sketchbooks right so i mean each one of these drawings is like this big hmm. right so they're just small little things they don't really have value i mean they have value now because of like my bigger body yeah. of work and it's kind of interesting but back then there was just no, there was just no path forward to so that's why i would just rip them out and like give them to people so yeah. you know mo almost everything from this era is gone you know i probably gave away like half or two-thirds of all the drawings that i did i was just constantly giving them away yeah um and so then you have stuff like this like you can see how big the uh stay you alive see how big the sketchbook is yeah and <laughs> because that was probably me going like oh well you can't use words 
like that's against the rule. And I'm like, well, why is it against the rule? Like yeah. I should, and if I feel like something's against the rule and I can't do it, then what? I'm just not going to. So then I would have to be like, well, now I have to put it on there because even though it doesn't work, but I'm like, well, now I have to do it or else I'm living under the the tyranny of this fear that I have. Yeah. So the the biggest, the biggest rule was do what needs to be done no matter yeah. what. Yeah. And, um, and so this is like me going like, well, what if I just like, just really just did like no curating at all in my thought process and just did like, just don't think this don't yeah. think, just draw, just draw, just draw. Don't think, don't think, don't think that's the rule. Right. Hmm. But I'd already established like, well, just use this one kind of pin and only black. And, you know, so there's these underlying rule structures that, you know, I built on over time. And then I'm like, well, it actually works out better if you kind of reduce stuff, right? So you take this and then I'm like, okay, well, let me reduce all the nonsense and then give it like a more mm. structured kind of idea, you know? And this would have been like years later too, like this. Yeah. This is another one of these things like where I revisited a idea later or it was just in me in me at some point. So this was probably I'm 25. This is 28 maybe. It's 28, you know. And then I discovered like dots and I'm like, "Oh, dots actually are really cool. Like the repetition of dots and how you have things like descending down i'm like well that's kind of like what's going on with consciousness it's like you have this like you know like when you're high on mushrooms you know and you get like tracers where it goes it's like this fractal moment where you have your attention that goes like this 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 yeah and i'm like oh that's kind of like each one of these dots is like a moment that's kind of doing that so i got really infatuated with dots so, um, and then I'm like, oh, there's like these kind of like hypnotic qualities yeah. that can happen if you do a bunch of dots and descending and, you know, so, so you, then you find these like little motifs that are like, oh, that's cool. I'll develop that later. And so, you know, so now even I go back, so this would have been, I was probably like 35 when I did this, right? Whoops. So then, and then I go into a biotech lab and I'm like, oh, okay, well, I'll just do this on a door, you know? But it's the same, you know, so now that now it's like this kind of things like out in the world. And when people see this in their environment, rather than like a little sketch in a drawing in a sketchbook, like it takes on new weight. You know, people are like, whoa, this is like a thing in the environment, like a insect or a flower or something. And yeah. so it's a whole different part of your brain that you engage with when it's as big as a person. Yeah. And so once I do it, once I realized that going on to the wall was gonna be really good for me like that's for a lot of reasons but that that's what that that was the line through to start making money so that i could actually live as an artist yeah so this is like way later on where i'm like take like a certain kind of a straight so this way i probably was like 33 when i did this 33 34 and um, so I would take like basically an idea and I would evolve it, right? Mm -hmm. Specifically, I'm like, now now I'm like taking a rule structure and putting it through time. Hmm. I'm like, well, what if it grew like a biological force? Like, what if it was like an algorithm that existed in the world, hmm. right? So I would start messing around with that a lot. And then this ended up becoming like a canvas that I just did a couple of years ago. Cause I had developed this style where I'm like, oh, okay, this style works pretty cool. And yeah. so then I would do this and then eventually it would make it onto, so this is like me inverting this style. So instead of all the black, I did it the opposite, yeah. right? So black and white, not really super successful, but kind of cool. And then this is like another room that I did where I would take the similar kind of strategy, but now this is like a whole environment that you walk into. And then you develop things like, well, what if I did like a bunch of little hash marks in it? And then you have this, it gives it a little more dimension. This is like me actually drawing, trying to figure things out. Hey, that was a ruler. In a sketchbook. Yeah, later, later, once I became, <laughs> once I became, yeah, I know, right? Well, the rules change, you know? So once I became <laughs> competent at being able to draw and 
you know, then I was like, okay, well now there's all these other tools that I can use to really make it and bring it into like the next level. Yeah. Right. And so now, now I have no problem. Now I'll use whatever tool I have. It's not a big deal because my hand is so strong. Yeah. And, um, you know, like I'm so kind of masterful at being able to, you know, whatever gesture I want to use on a wall or a piece of paper, I can basically do it, but, you know, doing like super, you know, sharp edges like this, like you, unless you use a ruler, you're not going to get the right feeling, right? Yeah. Like if I tried to do all that by hand, it would be cool. Don't get me wrong, but it would, it would have a different feeling than yeah. if I did it uh, all perfect like that. Yeah. And so it just, it, it just gives a different quality. So just understanding what strategy yields, what result is part of mastery. But eventually I think like after about 10 years of me drawing everything by hand, then I started letting myself use tools. Got it. And this is, this is in my, but this is all freehand. Um, <laughs> so this is in my sketchbook, but this is, this would have been all, well, no, this is not freehand. No, this would, would have been with a ruler actually. Well, about half and half, like the difficult, the difficult lines would have been, um, would have been with a ruler and then all the other stuff, like in the bottom, like that's all by hand probably. And then that, I mean, this is my, this is my shop. So this kind of thing, it ended up becoming a canvas and then I had this window display. And so you can just see like different variations. And then this eventually became this. So this uh, this is one of my more well known pieces. This is in Berkeley. It's one of the biggest, one of the biggest, probably the biggest mural in Berkeley. And so then I would like, then then I started getting into these like archetypal forms where I started getting really infatuated with like starbursts or like black holes, where it seems like the the most fundamental symbol is one that represents things either coming into being or exiting being yeah, itself the center and so yeah like source like a star yeah and so i just uh, once i hit this i i became i'm still infatuated with this like this is probably my my fundamental interest and you know, th this, once I, once I discovered this kind of structure, I was like, okay, well, this is, this pretty much encapsulates everything that I'm going for. And, yeah. and it was another form that I could always come back to and experiment with. This one always blows my so mind. Then I would do, There's another one that you've this got. One? No, the, the last one. It, Cause it's this one? No, the previous one. It's like an optical illusion and I just can't. Yeah. I oh, know the one after this, but I just can't believe that you could do that. Like, I feel like I would go insane drawing this because it's like, you're constantly looking yeah, at you kind of illusion that's twisting your eyesight. Yeah. It's just mind blowing to me that you can do this by hand. Yeah. Yeah. This is a, that's a two foot by three foot ink drawing that's done with like micron pens. Hmm. But yeah, yeah. I mean, you just get into a mode. You know, you just sit there and just do it. It's like a meditation prize. I mean, it's basically what monks are doing all the time, yeah. but they're just looking at their brain. Whereas I'm looking at my brain while I'm using a pen. Yeah, it reminds me so of this. It's a lot more productive. The, the Tibetan sand <laughs> ma mandalas. Yeah, yeah. Same, same, same kind of strategy. And, you know, this all just kind of evolved intuitively from just like following this basic intuition which was all grounded in this spiritual experience of connecting with the deeper me i guess or a higher potential or some transcendent force that's just said do this do this go down this path because you know in my spiritual experience when i was in the middle of it and i realized that i was gonna forget you know i was gonna have this amazing experience of like god or reality or whatever and then my stupid human brain would just be like well what about you know i don't know just i'm hungry let me, let me go get a cup of coffee or whatever and then all of a sudden you're just out of it because three hours later you're like oh yeah i was like having this transcendent experience where i was thinking about god and then i was like i wanted to get a croissant yeah you know what i mean and then all of a sudden you're like halfway 
into your day and you're like, what the hell? Like I completely forgot what I was doing. But this is a way of being able to tie that experience to where, you know, it's it's this thing that keeps you coming back and focuses your attention. You know, hmm. this is, how it's like a you, container for a, How did your idea of the transcendent or God or the spiritual change or evolve as you did these paintings over decades? Well, when I had my first spiritual experience, because I've had like many, 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 many spiritual experiences since then. But my first one, I was like, okay, this is what God is. This is what truth is. Whether or not people see it or not, this is the reality. This is absolute truth. I have seen it and whatever. It was very Christian because that's what I grew up in. And then now I'm like, I have no idea what's going on. Like the more I investigate and interrogate, that it just keeps going yeah it just keeps going and going and going and going and there's always this feeling of like it feels right or it feels wrong or i'm like closer to god or away from it you know i'm either going into the light or i'm being you know lost in darkness you know but that moment to moment experience is always changing and then you know in the beginning i was just like all about christ and Jesus and you know and then later you know I learned about Buddhism and the Bhagavad Gita and all you know the monomyth and all of this and I'm like oh okay wait a minute there's like this is way bigger than I thought it was going to be and then I'm like yeah of course like if God is the creator of the universe but we have this one star here in our local solar system it's like hmm it's not Jesus. It's not like Jesus is like the creator of the universe. I'm like, that's just a human thing. So then I discovered Jung in the God image. And I'm like, okay, well, it makes sense if yeah. it's the hu the human God is, is Chris Christ because he's yeah. fully man and fully God and takes the form of like a human. And yeah. I'm like, okay, well, that makes sense. So then, so then I could have place for Christianity again mm. after that. And then I'm like, but then that also allows for, you know, the hindus to have their god image of brahman you know or shiva or whatever i'm like that's what makes sense to them but then in the pantheon of all of these gods there's gonna be ones that are closer to the truth than other ones because it's all this weird gradient so it's just you start looking at this stuff and you're like okay well where is the boundary that allows me to understand what absolute truth is and not and you're like fuck dude it doesn't even matter or it does it's not there because, you know, we're finite beings in an infinite universe. And as soon as you fill up an area of knowing, you realize that it's surrounded by infinite possibilities yeah. again and again and again. And so, and whatever human beings are evolving into in a thousand years is going to be way different than what we are now. You know, like maybe there's going to be like a God, like a Jesus on Mars kind of thing, you know, mm -hmm. or a Jesus of the moon or something. I don't know. I have no idea. But, yeah. you know, in the beginning, because I think I was so afraid and overwhelmed that I had to have like a rigid value structure, religious structure in order to be able to keep my mind safe. Because if you start questioning things too much and you don't have a vessel to be able to rest in like you, you'll just drift and then you could end up being like Nietzsche or something where you just like hug a horse and then detach from reality and float off and there's no that silver string that keeps you connected to the world just breaks and all now yeah. all of a sudden you've lost your mind and it seems like what happens to a lot of artists actually yeah and it seems like you've been trying to figure out your value structures through your art because you you often yeah. say that, yeah like I'm externalizing a value structure or I'm trying to mm -hmm. like feel out this line is right, this one is wrong. So I can yeah. see, you, and it's interesting that you like initially rejected the church, but then you've mm -hmm. kind of you're. It's like you're building your own personal church for you through your art. Like you're you're figuring out your values mm -hmm. through it in a way. It's like Jordan Peterson has this idea that the, yeah. the ultimate flourishing of Christianity is where every individual is their own church. And I, I can just see you figuring out your values. Yeah, but that's so that's true. But that's also like some Luciferian shit too, you know, where Lucifer, God's favorite angel, you know, comes down to earth and he says, I will be the one to gather up all the wayward sheep for you, my Lord. And it's not really for God, it's for Lucifer. 
Yeah. You know, so then it's this ego thing. And so then, you know, so you run the risk of like starting a cult, you know, yeah. or being like, it's Nietzsche like and trying to create your own values and be a Superman. And that's the thing is that even right. though you're externalizing value structures in your art, it's not like you're just creating yeah. new values. You're revealing existing values. But they're also, but the values are also not necessarily mine. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know what I mean? Like, exactly I'm just right. like, I'm just, yeah. I'm just just going into this place and I'm witnessing what the values are. Exactly. And yeah. I'm like, okay, because these values are what they are, I'm going to hitch my wagon to this and see where this goes. And it's played out. I mean, it's been so much. I mean, my path through life has been horrific um, in a lot of ways, but um, but in the end, it was all there waiting for me. And actually the challenges that I've gone through all along the way have been what's made me strong and able to do the work that I'm doing now, which is, you know, kind of larger than life in a lot of ways. Like to, to be able to have the capacity to do that kind of work, like you have to be very, very strong, you know, like all this stuff that I'm working out on a piece of paper, like now I work it on, on a city block sized building, Yeah, you know, and to be somebody that says, yeah, I'm the guy to do that. Like this is well within my core competency to get up on a 45 foot boom lift, run a project in the middle of San Francisco and just like paint my inner experience on the side of the wall and do it in a way where people are like, that's great. That has value. That's, you know, something that we want to participate in, at least with our, you know, attention and goodwill and then paying me to do it in the first place. I mean, to be able to do that to a certain extent, you have to have this giant ego, but in another way, it's like, this is just what I've been led to do. Hmm. Like, this is just a continuation of following the natural end point of putting one line on a piece of paper. And I'm just kind of like along for the ride, you yeah. know, even though I have a responsibility to keep the vessel strong enough so that this voice can be heard in this way and that's the real challenge is you know how do you as an artist especially living in san francisco generate the social capital necessary to exist in san francisco which is very challenging yeah and you know and be able to be true enough to allow this pure thing out and that juxtaposition is just like I mean, it's like in the you're in the cosmic vice grip. I mean, it's yeah. so brutal. I mean, you remember when when that first image of the black building with the white nest, you like I had a whole show in there, you know, of yeah. all this kind of work. And we came out and it was it was a challenging show. And um, you know, I had real issues. I was also drinking a lot at that time. So were you. Yeah, <laughs> and, yeah. and we would sit underneath the we sat underneath that building and we just screamed we screamed i mean screamed <laughs> as loud as you can possibly just screaming at the universe and it's like yeah. that is in there that's part of the work that scream even though you can't hear it in this work that you're looking at right there it's a fucking scream and yeah. i am screaming for my life going What are you feeling? I mean, right it now? takes. It takes more than I have to give to be able to do this correctly. And I have to find resources that I don't currently possess. Hmm. And that stretch is overwhelming. It's an act of and faith. And it's so, yeah. And it's, and in order to be able to get to, to find your way in that, you have to be so tuned into your emotions because it's so subtle and you have to be so pristine and so clear to be able to find your way. Because if you fall at this level, it's going to hurt. You see it all the time with big public people that get overwhelmed or artists, you know, yeah, and it fucking blowing off their heads or getting into drugs or whatever. It's because 
they climb, 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 climb. And then they get distracted with like money or fame or whatever. They get their value structure fucked up. And then all of a sudden they're in their bedroom at home after a tour spinning, being like, I thought that this would all make me happy, but it's not because, you know, because they're not connected. Maybe their deeper spiritual values with what their work is, whatever. So anyways, you just get, you just get into this world and you're just stretched. You know, you're just, I mean, I am doing this work. I am broken constantly. That's what the work is at this point. Mm. It's like, I'm just in there. Like I'm in that alchemical soup that's being like, I am what is transforming. Like I am the matter that's being transformed into whatever, some divine being. And so then, you know, you go back and you look at Christ and being, you know, on the cross and resurrected, you know, like the, the current version of Christ has to die painfully to be reborn as the new version. And it's like, when you're doing this kind of work and you're putting it all on the line and you're just like, I'm not doing this anymore. There's something coming through me and the demands to be able to do that is so scary and so intense. And you just hit these moments where all of a sudden it just blasts open, you know? And I mean, there's times when I'll be like on a wall painting, you know, and I'll have my sunglasses on and earphones in up on a wall. The city's like happening behind me. There's traffic honking. The world's just going on and I'm just weeping. Yeah. Well, mate, I I think that might be a good spot to end this podcast oh okay great but yeah. i want to continue this with you like okay i think i would love to hear more about your art and your pieces you've got a pro- you're prolific you've got an enormous amount of art and i would love to keep digging into it but this is yeah and someday we'll even get in the color <laughs> exactly yeah we're still Which only took 15 phase. years to get into but um, what was that but this was fascinating mate like i love oh good Like, I think so many people love your art and it resonates with them. But what resonates with me more is your experience and story as an artist. So I would love to keep exploring that on the pod. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, thanks. It's it's really helpful to actually externalize this and try to make sense of it to somebody that's outside of myself. Because as you can tell with the with the work, it's it's all intuitive. Right. So you're just kind of like. And so I'm not having to like make sense out of it. And then when you're like, oh, we'll put together a presentation. I'm like, well, fuck, how do I even do that? Yeah. You know, so it's cool. It it, it helps me because I'm able to start talking to people more uh, in a more coherent way. So I really appreciate it. And I appreciate your friendship. And, you know, as artists, you know, it's so difficult to do this work in so many ways and to be able to have uh, a friendship with with you and and to be able to going through this journey together and to be able to be heard in this space and be understood in this space there were years and years and years of me doing this work where i couldn't even i was just in this space and i couldn't even i was so far away from everybody like i couldn't have this conversation i couldn't have any of this and to be able to you know work with you for the year you know years and years that we've been friends and you know you, you helped me articulate this has like saved me in a lot of ways, you know? Thank you, mate. I appreciate that. And same to you, man. Your friendship means the world to me. Like I'm getting emotional just thinking about it. Like the some of the hardest times that I've been through spiritually, like you've been there for me. Um. So yeah, I love you, mate. Yeah, yeah. I love you too, man. Um. All right, great. Well, I'll talk to you on the other side. All right. Till next time. All right. See you later, man. Bye. 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 Bye.